Okay, Joshua, we are live on Facebook. Uh, welcome to another New Jersey Constitutional Republicans virtual conversation. It's my great uh, privilege and honor today to have Joshua Claiborne join me today. Thank you, Joshua. How are you today? Good. I'm very glad to be joining you. It's uh, great to have Joshua. He's uh, uh, an author, uh, uh, attorney. Uh, he's done quite a bit of uh, he does a great job with the Abraham Lincoln Association, which we'll be talking about in the Abraham Lincoln Lincoln Log podcast. So Joshua, just give us a little brief bio to our audience about uh, who you are. Sure. Um, my, like you mentioned, my name is Josh Claiborne. Um, I uh, practice law as my day job, focusing in particular on intellectual property, state and local government, along with utilities. Uh, but my primary passion outside of the practice of law is in history and public policy. Uh, much of my scholarship focuses on Abraham Lincoln's youth, um, written and edited several books and articles about that. And as you noted, and I'm sure we'll talk about, I'm involved with a lot of organizations uh, relating to Abraham Lincoln, uh, but also public mm -hmm. policy and current events. Uh, um, obviously it's important uh, what's going on, where we're headed and uh, like, like you, um, I'm very interested and invested in that. Uh, so I'm quite involved uh, politically and, and write a lot of essays and have edited some books on that topic as well. That's great. And uh, the reason, the way that I found out about you, Joshua, uh, was through the Lincoln Log, Lincoln Log podcast, which we'll talk about, which are outstanding. And I recommend all of our constitutional Republican members and all the citizens of New Jersey uh, to tune in and we'll talk about that. But first I wanna talk about a very, very interesting and a book that I've really enjoyed reading and here it is, it's called Our American Story. And Joshua uh, edited this book, The Search for a Shared National Narrative. Mm -hmm. And this is a book that you wanna get out and you're gonna to want to read and you're gonna read it a couple of times because it's very, very interesting. Now, Joshua, what provided the impetus for you to write this book and to title it such? Well, um, uh... I think over the last two decades and probably longer, a lot of the complicated divides in our country of ideology, geography, class, religion, race, they create fractures that I, I, I view as deepening. Um, and each side is sort of getting on either side of this growing battle um, and seeing each other as the, as the other and not as a unified country. And so I really wanted to delve into this question of, can we be a unified country? Is there a narrative that can unify us as a country as well? And so really what I did is I reached out to some of the smartest people I know <laughs> and asked that question and um, got their feedback. And uh, to my surprise and pleasure, they agreed to write an essay. And as one or two got on, several more did. And before I knew it, I had what I thought was a great um, um, collection of really smart people from all walks of life, historians, politicians, um, public policy makers and, and really just compiled a group of essays. You know, it's, um, it's an interesting group because they don't always agree and it doesn't necessarily come with an easy answer, but I think nonetheless, it, even sort of right. a messy, uh, uh, shotgun approach to, to where we are and where our narrative is, is still informative and, uh, it's a good conversation to have. Absolutely. And I just want to share with the audience, some of the, uh, writers, the essayists that you had, that David Blight, you start out with, he's probably the foremost authority on Frederick Douglass mm -hmm. uh, that we have, that he, he writes a very interesting piece on the composite nation. Um, also, you have uh, men like Gordon Wood, uh, mm -hmm. Senator John Danforth, uh, Jim Banks from uh, Indiana, where, uh, of course, Josh was from, and um, also Eleanor Cliff, who was a longtime sparring partner with Patrick Buchanan on the McLaughlin Group, I'm sure uh, people recognize. And then, of course, uh, Cass Sunstein uh, contributes, and also Richard Epstein. And I uh, just want to go through a little bit. I uh, don't want to give too much of the book away for the people to read, but a couple of points that I thought were very interesting, Joshua. Uh, is that um, I essentially agree very much with, uh, with Gordon Wood and his uh, uh, articulation of the need to go back to the principles of the Declaration of Independence uh, as really being a unifying factor. Uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, and Gordon Wood, um, I mean, what a remarkable guy, right? He, um, uh, I would argue, is the, the foremost living authority on the American Revolution. 
Um, I mean, mm-hmm. probably nobody's won more awards for his writing and, and his research. Um, he really focuses on the idea of equality as the most radical and powerful ideological force that the revolution unleashed. And he, uh, he sees that, that idea of equality still alive and well, despite its uh, disturbing and unsettling consequences. And, and so he really focuses on that notion as something that, that does and can unite us um, and provide sort of a unifying narrative for America. Mm-hmm. And uh, I thought uh, Senator, former Senator John Danforth, who we surely miss in the Senate, um, wrote a very uh, interesting, he made some very interesting rem- remarks about a topic that we talk a lot about, and that is the um, really the deterioration of the structure of the Constitution as Madison and the founders wanted it or envisioned it to work. And he really goes into that as one of uh, as being one of our uh, problems with the nation or our political system. Yeah, and if I could just real quickly just touch on what an amazing person I think John Danforth is. He's so well rounded. I mean, he's he's an attorney. Mm-hmm. I think he's an historian. He's he's uh, yeah. a theologian. I mean, really mm-hmm. an amazing guy. And not I think if you dig into his biography, it's very clear. But not a lot of people realize that when George W. Bush tasks Dick Cheney to come up with who should be his vice president, Dick Cheney recommended John Danforth. And Mm -hmm. George W. Bush said, thank you for the recommendation, Dick, but I want you. But it just goes to show, I think, how much uh, folks think of John Danforth and really also how close he was to being vice president in the presidency. Um, But he really does talk on, uh, you know, the need for some, for more unity in the, in the country. And, uh, um, and, and a functioning government, um, but that, that really focuses on um, incorporating separated individuals into a, the wholeness of the community. Um, mm-hmm. He, uh, you know, I think he gives some great insight and in, in where he comes from, and obviously his perspective is an important one. Right, and of course, Jim Banks from your home state there as well, um, also wrote a very uh, uh, enlightening essay, and you have, we have a lot of respect for him because he actually uh, enlisted and went, served in the uh, in our armed forces, and uh, he had some interesting insights as well. I thought. Yeah, J- Jim is, and if you haven't had him on the show yet, um, you really ought to. Jim and I actually, we go back all the way to high school. We were friends in high school. Uh, we went to college together. Uh, he was just a year or two older than me, and we were involved in a lot of the same activities. You know his wife really well. I mean, he's one of my one of my really good friends, and he's really making waves and in Congress uh, significantly so. I think um, you know, he's now one of the, one of the, in my opinion, top leaders in the House, uh, House of Representatives, at least on the uh, Republican side. Um, I think he's gonna continue to be a force that shapes the future of the Republican party. Uh, and you know, I, he will be a figure that's around um, our public policy making for decades, in my opinion. And, and um, who knows that someday even uh, could be knocking on the doors of the White House. So. Uh, Jim is a guy to keep a, an eye on, and I think what he has to say about this is something we ought to listen to. Whether you agree with it or not, it's something you're going to have to contend with. Um, Jim doesn't talk about this as much in the essay in that book, but what is interesting about Jim is um, he's really one of the Republicans, I think, leading the charge on reshaping the Republican Party as a working class party. Um, yes, and obviously, good. you know, obviously, ex President uh, Donald Trump um, really highlighted that issue and, and, you know, you, some could argue that 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 um, that those changes in that evolution was in place with or without Trump. But there's no question he, at, at a minimum, symbolized it and possibly helped hasten it along. And I think um, Jim has really taken up that torch and wants to be somebody who really continues to um, push the Republican Party in that direction as being a, a voice for the working class. So, um yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see what what, uh, what all Jim has to say and where he goes uh, from here. But uh, yeah, he'd be another good guest on your show for sure. Well, uh, Joshua, we're going to take you up on that uh, uh, invitation. And if you would let, kindly let uh, Jim know, we'll be calling because I would yep. love to have him on the show. I'll do and that. I'll send him be, the link I to think the chat. He'll be very right. enthused. Yeah. Good. And I think he'll be enthused about what we're doing is the constitutional Republican movement moving back towards the ideas of Lincoln. Of course, Lincoln talked about labor and working. And of course, the Republican Party was a middle class party uh, from its initiation. So, uh, uh, you know, Jim, I think is going to fall 
all uh, be very happy with the, the work that we're trying to do here in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Also, I wanted to mention too, uh, uh, Joshua, you had to Professor Richard Epstein. Now, if uh, core processors are being pro are being produced by Intel, I would think that they would want to use uh, Professor Epstein's um, mind to design it because his, his mind works, I think, f uh, three or four times faster than the than the normal human being, mine anyway. But uh, I thought he had a very brilliant um, uh, essay too. And he talked about uh, some of the uh, foibles associated with the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's, uh, as, as you know, he's, an, he's a great American legal mind. Um, mm -hmm. I believe between him and um, Cass Sunstein, who also contributed to the book, they're two of the most, if not the two most cited law professors um, alive and I think even in history they when they write other law professors sit up and listen whether they agree with it or not um, so again I was very um, honored that they agreed to take part two you know he's a he's a contrarian type of guy with a lot of public policies libertarian minded type of person so mm -hmm. I think um, he was a good perspective because the idea of a, of a potential shared American narrative he takes a little bit of a skeptical approach to it um, mm -hmm. that it, it to the extent it can be achieved um, it has to be achieved through what he calls American minimalism, which is really a reduction in the issues that we think are best handled as a nation right. at, at the government level. And, you know, that's a that's a real nice intellectual way of, of articulating, I think, the libertarian position, you know, of um, yeah. government to the extent we can we have or can achieve a shared American narrative. Government is probably not going to be the vehicle that gets us there is really at the end of the day what what Richard Epstein promotes. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, speaking of Cass Sunstein, I did want to make note, uh, Joshua, that uh, he said that uh, Bobby Thompson had a home run in 1951 that uh, led the Brooklyn Dodgers to the pennant, but that is incorrect. It was actually the New York Giants. And just so that the new, some of the New York Giant fans that may still be around don't get too upset with Cass, uh, it was indeed Bobby Do Thompson who hit the sh called the shot her around the world. You uh, know, I, was uh, I had... I had, that was one of the most common uh, responses to the book <laughs> was that air. Yeah. And I feel terrible that uh, we let it go because my father's a big Dodgers fan. So uh, yeah, that was, that, oh, but okay. I think that was the only factual air in the whole book was, was in that, yeah. that baseball reference. But um, yeah, he, um, you know, Cass isn't, like I said, he's, he's a, he, he actually was a law professor for Barack Obama. Uh, Obama yeah. then brought him into the administration and then Cass is a wife actually served as an ambassador to the UN and I believe now is part of the Biden administration as well. So um, I have a lot of respect for Cass, what he uh, has done and what he continues to do in terms of academia and government as well. Um, but he really takes, uh, you know, I, Cass is hard to put, put in a box in terms of his ideology. I mean, I know he worked in the Obama administration, but you know, he's, he's not, he's a bit of a free agent and you, it's, you can't put yeah. him in a box. And um, he, takes this working class approach as well in his essay and really, I think, highlights the, uh, the farmers of the American Revolution as embodying the American narrative and um, uh, focuses on them. And, you know, what's interesting about that is, you know, Cass would, at the end of the day, what I, I now anyway identify as a Democrat, I'm sure, but you can hear echoes of the working class uh, mantra that you hear folks like Congressman Jim Banks talk about as well. So um, reaching across the divide, there's some potential um, shared narratives among uh, people of different parties. Yeah, I thought his, uh, narr his essay was excellent. It was very uh, towards the middle. It wasn't what you would expect. Mm -hmm. But I, when I did read that, Joshua, I just got to say, I was just hoping that George Will never wrote, never read, <laughs> read the mistake yeah. he made with Bobby Thompson. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure you would have heard about it from him. Right. But anyway... Uh, what, what is really brilliant about the book, Josh, right? now we talked about some of the people that would be more ideologically aligned with us and being conservatives and Republicans, but you also give the other side, which is very interesting and very important in order to come to uh, trying to articulate a national narrative. Uh, Marcus uh, Melitisass mm -hmm. uh, wrote a very, uh, uh, what you could call a very woke position, if you will. But uh, of course, there's validity in, in some of these arguments, and they all need to be uh, need to be uh, discussed and uh, contemplated. That's right, you know. And, and um, he he helped uh, form the Daily Coast, which is spelled K O S, which is uh, sort of taken from his name. And he then helped 
uh, start Vox Media. So he is a big, big figure on the left. And, um, you know, like I said, it's it, this is really a, um, a combination of folks from across the ideological perspective and across different uh, professions as well to really get a good uh, variety and diversity of thought. Um, and I, I think one of the problems that gets talked about a lot nowadays with social media playing a part of this is we get um, put into various silos. And we mm -hmm. unfortunately, whether you're on the left or the right, tend to listen to and read perspectives that you agree with. And I think mm -hmm. it's very important that we contend with others. Um, at the end of the day, if we want to have a functioning country, we have to be able to converse and even convince other people that may disagree with us. So yeah, I, you, we, we got a really good diverse uh, perspective here and I was glad he participated. And you're right. I mean, I guess uh, woke is probably uh, one of the better ways to, uh, to, d to describe it. But you know, at the end of the day, his right. position really is that anyone seeking a better life can aspire to, uh, to achieve that and everyone has an equal opportunity to it. And uh, that, that's our unifying narrative. And in a sense, that harkens back to Gordon Wood's equality as one of the narratives that can unite us. Right. And then uh, uh, Jason uh, Kuznicki, too, also with the uh, plastic age, I thought was very yeah, he's uh, aligned. He's another libertarian. Um, and um, he's, he's very involved with Cato Institute as an employee there. And I'm, I have a lot of respect for his thinking. And he's one of the unsung heroes, in my opinion, um, in the libertarian movement, um, sort of toiling away in the trenches of publications and essays and um, whatnot. Uh, maybe not a rock star libertarian like some of the others, but certainly somebody I think is, uh, provides a lot of good insight. Mm-hmm. And uh, really, it's the, the book has got so much diversity uh, that it really gives you a full picture of, you know, history isn't always uh, clean and clear cut. You know, it's usually messy. It, it's very gray. And you can see that in a lot of these in the essays, essays that the uh, that these authors have written. And it's not it's, com it's more complicated. We like to have a short um, bullet point uh, talking points. To describe things you really can't do that uh, with history and overall american history but i do want to say joshua that i think that really uh you know you write the beginning introduction of the book but really i believe that you you give us the conclusion and in, in articulating what linking said about the concepts of equality that uh, pr are provided in the declaration of independence as an aspiration mm -hmm. and it's something that we're constantly looking to uh, constantly laboring for, and even though never perfectly attained, uh, constantly approximated, and thereby constantly spreading and dependent its influence and augmenting the happiness and value of life to all people of all colors everywhere. And I really think that's the, that's the period, that's the concluding statement of the book, really, in, in many ways. I don't well, want to thank spoil you. Uh, no, I and I agree. And, you know, um, I'm a Lincoln guy, but I think his his constantly pointing back to the Declaration of Independence really transformed our view of the Constitution, who we are as a country. Um, and and I think that's a, a possible I think that's a direction of way forward is to look back to the Declaration as a as a unifying narrative and and as really our our lodestar, uh, the, the guiding yes. light. Uh, by which we can we can find a way forward as a country and as a people. And that's that's the impetus uh, be, why we created the Constitutional Republican Movement to get the Republican Party back to readopting the principles of the Declaration of Independence in policy making and in platform. Mm -hmm. uh, you know that's that's our foundation. That's what we look to to gu to guide us as Lincoln did. Now let's talk about uh, this outstanding book that I really have enjoyed. I'll be going back to this quite a bit, and it's called Abe's Youth. And you had a co-author, William Bartlett, with you here, or Bartelt, is it pronounced? Yes, Bartelt, uh-huh. Yeah, the one you thing know, the, go ahead. I was just going to say, Joshua, that the one thing that the reader is going to, uh, obviously the reader wants to, uh, you want to get out there and buy this book. It's on Amazon as well as our American story. But in this book, you're gonna find out right away the amount of work that it was entailed uh, that you, Joshua, did and William in putting this work together. T talk a little bit about the hard work and the, and the delving into the information you had to do to pr produce it. 
Well, Lincoln spent a quarter of his life from age seven to 21 in, in southwestern Indiana. And um, unfortunately, despite being a critical time, it's not one that's talked about. It's not one that's written about. And it's not one that's researched. Think about your right. own life from age seven to 21. How influential was that period on who you were, or I should yeah. say, how you think, what you believe, yeah. your perspective on the world? I mean, really, there's few, if any other period of your mm-hmm. life that's more critical or important. So why, when we think about our greatest president or one of our greatest presidents, um, somebody who's had more written about him than uh, second only to Jesus Christ, um, right. why do we know so little about his youth? Um, and, and that's always bothered me. And now I have a little bit of a bias being somebody from the same very general region, but I think even an objective person has to admit that's a critically, uh, important time to who Lincoln is. So I've spent a lot of my time looking into that. And, um, unfortunately though, because it was on the frontier, um, and because his work in the white house and in DC overshadowed it so much, there's just not a lot there. And so, um, I wanted to go back and look at some of the source material we had uh, after Lincoln had died. Um, and as the Civil War vets had had started to pass away, a lot of folks mm-hmm. in the area in Indiana where Lincoln grew up um, felt it was important to uh, record what they could of his life and times, uh, the people he knew, um, what they ate, what medicine was like, how they farmed, that sort of mm-hmm. thing. And these essays and speeches that were done, you know, in the early 1900s um, really just were relegated to loose leaf papers and libraries scattered throughout the Midwest. And so we went around collecting them, um, edited them and put them together. You know, I have to be clear that it's not a pure biography of his time in Indiana. I am working on one of those as we speak. It's rather Mm -hmm. a collection of here's what the environment was like where he grew up. So for instance, there's a doctor who talked about this is what medicine was like during the time, et cetera, et cetera. Some of the prose is a little bit dated because it's from the early 1900s, but it nonetheless gives you a good sense of what it was like for Lincoln to grow up um, um, in this area. There's no question about it. And uh, talk a little bit about Roscoe Kuyper. Uh, He obviously had a lot to do with uh, uh, the information regarding Lincoln in his Indiana years. Yeah, um, he is uh, certainly an important person there. You know, we've got quite a bit of people that um, were um, attorneys, uh, that sort of thing. And um, Roscoe Kuyper is uh, one of those folks. He's a a judge um, that had a good sense of uh, the legal environment that uh, Lincoln grew up in. And um, he talks a lot about that. You know, some of the... um, uh, environment generally, but especially the legal environment. A lot of folks have this, in my opinion, misconception that Lincoln learned the law in Illinois, and certainly he did for the most part, but I think a lot of the inspiration came here. I mean, he was able to see a lot of uh, lawyers and attorneys practice. Um, uh, You know, for that period of time, when you're working and toiling away in the field all day, your forms of Mm -hmm. entertainment were um, these big trials that would come along and you'd have a big murder trial and the whole community would come to see these big, you know, productions that the attorneys and the court would put on. Um, so it was a big deal. And we can rest assured that Lincoln went, uh, to see that as well. And, um, I'm sure he viewed that as, and if, if, if some of the second and third hand, uh, source material that we have suggests that that was his inspiration, what he saw in Indiana, um, and um, the likes of Roscoe Kuyper certainly provide a good insight into that. Right, and I also thought it was interesting, Joshua, um, the influence that a uh, John A., um, um, the, the uh, gentleman um, who ran against Breckenridge. Yes. Uh, John A. Breckenridge, the attorney who had an influence on him, and he wasn't the only Breckenridge, of course, who Lincoln would be uh, identified with, of course, in 1860, he ran against John C. Breckenridge, and I don't believe that they were um, they were familial, but right. uh, of course, John Breckenridge went on to be a Confederate general and surrendered the uh, Western Confederacy to uh, uh, to uh, William Tecumseh Sherman in 1960. Right. Yeah, they, they were not related, although uh, Breckenridge had his own ties to the area as well, which is quite interesting also. But yeah, he was an attorney... Um, uh, from the area that um, an oft-repeated legend suggests that Lincoln traveled to see him uh, speak in court um, at a murder trial 
and that when uh, Mr. Brackenridge went to D.C. some years later, allegedly, Lincoln said, your speech was what inspired me to practice law. Now, we have some reason to um, question the validity of, of that particular statement, but this actually in the research for this for the very first time uncovered that this attorney Brackenridge did in fact have a um, murder trial in 18, about 1828, which would have been the time Lincoln was there and could have seen it. And so it very well may have been the inspiration for Lincoln to practice law. Again, a little bit of homerism of the Hoosiers pointing out uh, the Hoosier inf influence on Lincoln that it all didn't just happen in Illinois. No question. And also uh, Little Pigeon uh, Baptist Church. Mm -hmm. and of course, Roscoe Kuyper went so far to say that Abraham Lincoln was religious. And we read that right in your book. And I think that's very interesting because, you know, we saw we've seen over uh, the period of time uh, throughout the life of Lincoln, it seemed that more and more the religious aspect uh, of his upbringing came about, especially in the second inaugural and many of the remarks that he made, his belief in the providence of God, all of the Calvin, uh, apparently the church was a Calvin church, Calvinistic church, and uh, the belief in the predestination and the sovereignty of God and all things. And this was all shaped right there at the, in, in many ways, right there at that church, correct? Ab ab absolutely. Now, you know, th there remains a, a healthy, vigorous debate as to how religious or to what degree Lincoln identified with a particular church, but there is absolutely right. no question that he was significantly influenced by religion, um, that mm -hmm. God in some way, shape or form uh, shaped and molded and uh, drove his worldview. You know, Alan Gelzo, who's a, is a fantastic attorney, uh, fa fantastic historian, uh, wrote a, a great mm -hmm. book called Redeemer President, which um, won all yep. sorts of awards. And I think that's a great a book that delves into that as well. Um, mm -hmm. You know, some of Lincoln's speeches, including his second inaugural, are some of the most um, religious that any president has ever given. So there's no doubt that to contend with Lincoln, you have to contend with um, his um, religion and his uh, theological views. Again, you know, there are tenets of the Christian faith that maybe at various times he, he would disagree with, um, but there's no doubt that that religion was a major influence on who he is and who he was. Right. And a couple, a couple of other interesting uh points that were made. Uh, Abraham uh, blamed his brother-in-law for his sister's death. Is that correct? Yeah, you, you know, there's, a, and that's a really sad story. And, you know, it gets back to, um, I think, uh, the unfortunate way in which Indiana gets overlooked, his sister's death, and then he lost his mother, of course, as well. And right. the loss of those, those two folks in his life were major, major blows that um, uh, just had a tremendous effect on who he was how he viewed the world. And uh, I think, uh, you know, he, he ended up, yeah, blaming some other people for that. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, there was some medical um, um, plants that, uh, that, that, that the cattle would eat and the, it poisoned the, the milk. And, you know, they, they just, uh, yeah. they, they, they didn't know that at the time what caused it, but, but, but it did. And, um, and he lost them at a very early age, and it was very influential on who he was and how he looked at things. Yes, and it was interesting that uh, the gentleman's name was Gris Grisby, I believe, and Grisby's father was actually raised by the uh, by the Native Indians of that era or that area. And uh, one of the things that I thought was interesting in the book, uh, Joshua, and of course, uh, you're being true to history, uh, which gets often overlooked, especially in our woke culture now, is the fact that there were tremendous atrocities committed by uh, the Indians on the, the very few white settlers that would go out there. And uh, this is all well documented, and it's, a, a, it's attributable to the accuracy of the uh, historical information you put forth in the book. Right. Um, you know, and um, Lincoln's... Um, and Native Americans are interesting because of um, they have had quite a bit of um, interaction um, and particularly how they can handle. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he killed his grandfather. They killed his grandfather. And, um, and, and that was a story that was told repeatedly. So although there were not Native Americans in his area of Indiana when they entered the area, it was not too long before that they still were and there were still conflict. 
So Lincoln grew up hearing quite a bit of stories about how um, violent and dangerous Native Americans were. Um, so right. um, that undoubtedly influenced his view of Native Americans. Now, having said that, he did take some very, very progressive positions uh, as it relates to Native Americans when he became president. Controversially, mm -hmm. he ordered the execution of some um, following some um, um, violence in Minnesota, and that's still a controversy to this day, actually, is one of the basis mm -hmm. that some people suggest his statues should be removed. But anyway, yeah, it's an interesting um, interaction with them. Right now, let's talk a little bit about the Abraham Lincoln Association, uh, Josh. Uh, th this is so important. If people, our audience, constitutional Republicans, are not a member of this organization, you should be. You're going to get great information uh, every month. They have a wonderful newsletter um, here, the Lincoln Association. There it is there. And also, you get a couple of journals every uh, uh, couple of times a year, too, Joshua, which are great. And right uh, here are the journals, and they're really great articles. Uh, of course, Dr. Galzo, our friend, uh, contributes. I'm sure Dr. Uh, or Lucas Morell, Professor Morell. Um, but talk about the ALA. Uh, let's talk a little bit about its history and why it's so important. Um, yeah, it's the oldest and largest Lincoln supported. organization to recognize and uh, observe uh, who Lincoln was and what his legacy is. So uh, every year we uh, celebrate his birth with a big banquet and a speaker. You noted one of the biggest and most important aspects of the ALA, the Abraham Lincoln Association, is our scholarship. So we put out uh, two mm -hmm. journals of scholarly articles about research and commentary on any aspect of Lincoln or some way or shape or form relating to him. And then we have a newsletter that comes out regularly too, quarterly, just about things that are going on. So if you're a history buff or love Lincoln, um, I highly recommend it. Um, you can go to abrahamlincolnassociation.org and uh, sign up for our email lists and become a member. Right, and we're gonna put links to your books and the ALA, ALA into the podcast. Joshua, let's talk a little bit now too about, and of course, talk a little bit about the another great scholar, Michael Burling Game, who's in. Is he? He's in, Isn't he the chair of the association? He is. Executive? He is. He's. He is the 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 president, and um, you know, he is. I would argue the 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 world's leading authority on Abraham Lincoln. Nobody alive. Mm -hmm. It's been said nobody alive knows more about Abraham Lincoln than Michael Burlingham. He spent his mm -hmm. entire career toiling away in archives and libraries, and um, mm -hmm. he would just constantly churn out books about Abraham Lincoln and really edited original source material. And then he came out with a two-volume book called Abraham Lincoln, A Life in 2008, which is really, some might say, he calls it the green monster because they're green. And actually, <laughs> you know, just over my shoulder, I've got a couple of copies. Yeah. Um, but uh -huh. he, um, he, you know, it, it's really in some, respects, or some respects the Bible on Abraham Lincoln. If you want a, mm -hmm. a reference on Lincoln and his life, I highly recommend Michael Burnham's books. All right. I've always said, Joshua, I'd love to have him in the room with Dr. Gelzo and Harold Holzer and our great friend, Dr. Lucas Morell, and just be a fly on the wall for that conversation. Yeah, them that, all four together. those are some great Lincoln scholars right there. Yep, absolutely. That's right. Now, talk to us about the podcast. Um, it's uh, There's about 14 editions, correct? Correct. Um, what was the, uh, talk to us a little bit about the podcast and the the. Uh, the initiative there? Well, sure. We speak with uh, leading historians and, and sometimes other officials about their stories, uh, their research, and whatever other type of wisdom they might have to share. There's typically some sort of Lincoln reference, occasionally a Civil War um, tie. Sometimes it's directly about Abraham Lincoln, um, but we have a lot of fun. I, I've focused in particular on folks that are intellectuals or academics who really dig into the finer points of history and Abraham Lincoln. So if you really want to get into dig into it in a deep way, um, we can do that. Although I will tell you, you know, we uh, I think at times we have a lot of fun and and talk about a wide ranging um, amount of issues, including current events and um, policy, um, and how Lincoln's ideas or philosophy might might shape them. Absolutely, and uh, I thought, of course, you've had great guests on. Um, one of them I thought that was very interesting that may not be as well known to people. Uh, was a man by the name of Dan McLaughlin. And uh, he had a fascinating show and something that I talk quite a bit about 
uh, about the seeds of progressivism that were actually started with the Confederacy and the administrative and bureaucratical state. I thought yes. that was a fascinating one. Yeah, and that was inspired by a, a, an essay he wrote. He's a prominent columnist for the National Review. Um, in mm -hmm. fact, he, I would say, is one of their more prominent uh, writers now. Uh, he was a full-time attorney and eventually just transitioned entirely to writing for National Review. And he had a pretty um, in, insightful essay. You know, there's some decent debate as to the thesis, but um, I think he makes a good um, case for it that a lot of the administrative state and uh, growth of that that we see is due to the Confederacy. You know, I think some of it is the Civil War in general, though. Um, and and mm -hmm. for better or worse, to win wars, a lot of times it takes a, a big bureaucracy. And so I think there was an administra administrative state growing on both sides of the North and the South at the time. But right. the Confederacy certainly contributed to it. Right. And we also have to remember, too, Joshua, that uh, that was the background and the environment from which a young Woodrow Wilson came. Yep. Of course, his father was his father was a pastor and uh, he was a Confederate. Right. Um, so, and of course, Wilson kept those beliefs really uh, right on through his presidency with his um, um, his support of the Ku Klux Klan, remarkably. So uh, we could see. And of course, he was uh, he was really the first political scientist to ever become president. And he wrote extensively in the late uh, 19th century on uh a government that looked more like Britain's government than uh, the government that our founders uh, had initiated. Yep, absolutely. Well, uh, you, the last episode that you had, of course, you had Dr. Gelzo. I had the great pleasure and honor of meeting, and I'll tell you a story, Josh. I actually took him a book of the uh, uh, history of the Republican Party that he had not he he had not read yet, that he does not have in his extensive library. And I was able to give him that. And that was written at the turn of the century by the, by the name of uh, his, his last, his first two names were George Washington, but he did, I, I can't remember the last name of the gentleman. So I'm sure people out there know, but Dr. Gelzo, of course, um, we actually were alum. We actually went to Philadelphia College of the Bible together many, many years ago. And um, we have the, he, we look up to him as our great mentor in, uh, in promoting this constitutional Republican movement, getting it back to Lincoln. But uh, your last part, uh, broadcast with him, I thought was absolutely fa uh, fascinating. He's writing a new book on all people, Robert E. Lee. Yeah, you know, he is, he is such a great speaker um, and historian. He's just an all around fascinating guy. Great guy to talk with. He was the first repeat guest I had um, on the podcast. Is the, the first one was incredibly popular. I got all sorts of responses and all sorts of downloads yeah. of it. So I had to have him back on. And I wanted to be the yeah. one of the first to interview him about his book on, on Robert E. Lee, which I'm sure will turn heads and we'll see it written about and reviewed everywhere. You know, yeah. I think, unfortunately, because Lee is such a um, controversial figure and there's so much to dislike about his position on, on the Confederacy that people right. shy away from writing about him in general now. And that's mm -hmm, unfortunate yeah. because he is an important figure. Um, yes. and there's a lot to learn and know about. And I'm so glad that somebody with um, Gelzo's uh, credentials have decided to take that up and, and write about it. So I am um, very eager to read it, to say the least. Yeah, that's going to be fascinating. And uh, also, I thought it was very interesting, Josh, in the interview, he said that uh, Lincoln, uh, the study of Lincoln has been far from exhausted. And he would have liked to seen some uh, deeper dives into Lincoln's uh, um, Lincoln in association with the Declaration of Independence, which I thought was remarkable that there could be a much deeper dive into that. Yeah. And, you know, I know that a lot of people have written about that. So I guess what he's saying is just not deep enough and not in certain areas. I've thought about that comment he made several times since then. Um, it's mm -hmm. almost like a challenge to people who like to write, you know, yeah. like. Yeah, uh, and, and I've thought about that almost as a challenge. Well, maybe I should take yeah. up a book about Lincoln and I did the, the same thing, and I'm not a writer. But. <laughs> so, uh, um, but but yeah, that that's isn't that amazing? You know, you think everything could be written that that could be said about Lincoln has been said, and yet somehow every year we've got more and more material to work to read and digest and work with. Yeah.
And I invite the listeners too, Joshua, as you talk about Dr. Gelzo, his ability to speak. Yes. He gave a speech a few years ago at the, uh, Washington and Lee University, and he was talking about the Gettysburg Address. Dr. Lucas uh, Morrell was the, was the host. And Dr. Gelzo that night, and I sent him an email, I said, you, you were on your absolute, that was the equivalent of pitching a no-hitter. I mean, he was absolutely astounding. His voice was rich and deep and he hit all the highs and the lows. And I can hear, I, I've got uh, lines from that speech um, memorized in my memory. And uh, that is one speech you're gonna wanna look up on YouTube when he gave it a couple of years ago. It may his, have been 2000. It's so great. It really is. And yeah. he, he has taught some <laughs> classes on this uh, organization called Great Courses on Lincoln and yes. the Civil War. And I've, oh, I've, man, I can't <laughs> recommend it enough because just no. his text is good enough. But then you add, a, add his voice to it and it's, it's a home run. Right. Now, as we uh, wrap up, uh, Josh, I really appreciate you being here. But uh, I do want you to know that we do have a Republican gubernatorial candidate here in New Jersey. His name is Jack Chatterelli. Uh, we've cultivated a great relationship and largely it's been around Abraham Lincoln. He is a great uh, uh, admirer of Lincoln. He, look, he goes back to Lincoln when he's unsure and he always talks about Lincoln going back to the Declaration of Independence when things would go awry or go back to the Constitution and the importance that the Constitution has in protecting the principles um, uh, expounded in the Declaration of Independence. But, uh, I think the Republican Party, especially in New Jersey, can be very, very proud. And I know that uh, uh, Republicans throughout the country want to get the Republican Party back, uh, form it back into the image of Lincoln. Uh, we've got that guy here in New Jersey. His name's Jack Cetarelli. And uh, hopefully I get to, you get to meet him someday and I can introduce you to him. But uh, we have a lot to be looking forward to with the Constitutional Republican Movement in the recreating the party back in the image of Lincoln. Well, I think it's great that you uh, have such uh, great guests come on and you're helping uh, advance a really important discussion. So I'm, I'm glad you're doing it and please keep up the good work. Well, I appreciate it, Joshua. Uh, again, thank you. Uh, I'd love to have you on again uh, soon to talk about things and uh, you're going to be, you're still writing books so we'll talk about them when they come out, but I certainly appreciate the time and, uh, and don't forget to uh, send uh, Jim Banks our, uh, our, uh, we'd love to have him join us uh, for a con NJCRVC because he's a Lincoln guy too. And we, we like all the Lincoln guys, that's for sure. But I'll thank do you that. very I'll, much. I'll send him a link to this and make sure he knows. <laughs> great. I appreciate that. And I appreciate you and all the great work that you do. And uh, please keep it up and, and keep in touch with us. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes our show. Please uh, like and share our show. Um, throughout all the social media outlets that you're able to. And let's remember what Lincoln said at the end, Joshua, liberty for all. Thank you very much. Good night.